that went first of September 2013. The bloodiest attack on Kenyan soil since Al-Qaeda's devastating bombing of the U.S. Embassy in 1998. More than 70 people dead, men, women and children, hundreds injured. Kenyans are asking how this could have happened. A band of heavily armed men from Al-Shabaab, the militant group that Kenyan troops have been battling in Somalia since 2011, penetrating a supposedly secure building in the capital. This attack did not come out of the blue. Since 2011, there have been more than 100 attacks in the country by Al-Shabaab and its sympathizers. <laughs> Most have taken place far from the glare of the international media in my home province, Northeastern, which shares a long and notoriously porous border with Somalia. But instead of enlisting the help of the mainly ethnic Somali population, the Kenyan army and police have treated us as part of the problem. For us, this is nothing new. In Kenya, all tribes are meant to be equal, but the reality remains that some tribes are less equal than others. This is Garissa, the gateway to Kenya's northeast province, my hometown. Five months before the attacks in Nairobi, I came back to investigate the escalating violence. Before Kenya's invasion of Somalia, these were the safest streets in the country. It's a bit unnerving for me, if I can put it that way, and also um, sad that uh, I finally have to come back to my hometown to cover conflict and killings, something I've done across Africa. I've never felt uh, like this. The insecurity is making things look totally different, you know. Never I've been covering other incidents in other places. There's this thought in the back of your mind that you'll go back home, it's safe, everybody is fine. Not anymore. Kenyan Somalis account for about 5% of the population just one of 42 tribes that make up this country. For centuries, we lived as nomads in the semi-arid lands of the Northeast, keeping camels, goats, and cattle. My own father grew up the son of a camel herder and will bring me here to the market to meet my uncles and cousins when they came to town to trade. Since I was a boy, it has grown to be the largest in East Africa, a result of the two-decade civil war across the border in Somalia, which made Garissa the safest and most convenient place to buy and sell. And it's still the best place to find out what is really going on. <laughs> The Kenyan government called the invasion Linda Inchi, Kiswahili for protect the nation, a response to cross-border raids by Al-Shabaab. But this part of the nation has not been protected. Since 2011, there have been more than 100 incidents of violence in the province. Garissa's small, non-Somali population have all too often been the target. Three days before I arrived, another attack occurred on a small street cafe in the center of town. The bullet hole still clearly visible. Oh, last year, there was a grenade attack here. Some people died. Early this year, some two officers were shot uh, in this area. You don't feel secure here? We, we feel very insecure. 
Bearing in mind that the police station is just 300 meters away. Killing someone is becoming as easy as slaughtering a chicken. So you keep on, you keep on counting your day. Huh? If you wake up tomorrow, just thank God. Before 2011, the worst Garissa hospital had to deal with was the occasional car crash. It's unsettling to find the place you were treated as a child turned into a trauma center. Nine people were shot dead that night and more than 20 injured, one of them fatally. Most of the victims were airlifted to Nairobi, leaving only two young boys just out of secondary school. Jackson Mutua was forced into the corner as the diners tried to escape. He was struck repeatedly, one bullet shattering the bone in his right leg. I, when I woke up now after, after being shot, I had to look at my leg first. I saw so blood everywhere on my clothes because of the people who had been shot. Some mm. were injured, some were dead. In your heart, what do you feel about that attack? When you remember it, how do you feel? To me, I feel it's hurting and those people, they are inhuman because I don't see the reason why you can just come and shoot and kill innocent people who are not guilty at all. If someone has got a problem, he has to address it to the people or to the right people, not to us as innocent citizens. And if we don't know nothing to them. Chege's cafe was popular with workers from other parts of Kenya, and because it served alcohol, was unlikely to contain Somalis who are almost exclusively Muslim. It's hard not to draw parallels with the religious violence in other parts of Africa. And this is perhaps what the perpetrators wanted. But Garissa has a history of religious tolerance and its imams share the town's grief. This is a memorandum which was agreed upon by the uh, Muslim scholars and leaders in Garissa town, particularly after the killing of uh, nine people uh, last week. We are against what, uh, what is going on and we condemn with the uh, strongest words possible. Our stand is that this is against the teachings of Islam, which says that Killing of one innocent soul is equal to killing all, all the people of, on, on this earth. For the outsider, this offers a confusing picture. The herders and merchants, residents and imams, all denounce the attacks and yet no one comes forward to help the police. But to understand this paradox, you don't need to look too far. When attacks like this occur, the government floods the town with police. Not just local police from the province, but riot police from Nairobi. The perpetrators know this and are long gone, leaving the residents of the town to face the forces. And all too often, the forces act like an occupying army. <laughs> One of the things I loved about my hometown was the way it came alive in the cool of the evening. Now a curfew sends everyone home at dusk, leaving the streets empty and leading to unflattering comparisons with Somalia's notoriously dangerous capital. At night time, you'll see this town is just like Mogadishu. You will not, in fact, Mogadishu is better than Garissa as we're speaking now, because the town is deserted. At night time, you'll not see policemen moving not see civilian moving. In what ways has the insecurity, the killings affected the people in town? 60% have no ID card. They have never been issued with ID card. You know the historical injustice of this place. And with the happening of these issues, now it has put the youth in a bad situation whereby they don't have ID card. If you don't have ID card, you are like an ally. Then it has led to so many youth being arrested. Some of them been taken that where we don't know up to now. Youth are finding themselves cornered in both sides. They have been here, they have been killed by Al-Shabaab sympathizers. Here they have been killed by government. The irony of a government that has failed to issue its own people with identity cards, then arresting them, is not lost on the population. 
know is the real reason behind the roundups. Unable to prevent these killings or catch the perpetrators, the government falls back on a tried and tested formula for Northeast Province, collective punishment. Although Garissa has seen almost two decades of peace before the current violence, my generation and that of my parents and grandparents are all too familiar with this tactic. For me, the first taste of what it was to be a Kenyan Somali came in 1980, when I was only five years old. Four government officials had been shot dead in a bar in Garissa by a group of unknown gunmen. That night, the police came to our neighborhood. This is where our house was. It's been almost 30 years, but I still remember playing with my friends on the streets here. Part of a closely knit community that was completely destroyed. I remember during that night, we were first asleep. It was around 10 o'clock at night. And suddenly we were woken up by loud noises of people running away, as well as uh, a lot of uh, chaos happening around us. Uh, when we got out of our house, uh, it wasn't anything like what you're seeing here right now. It was a mud, uh, walled, thatched house. And when we stood outside, we saw so many people running away in this direction. Uh, some of them running with their kids, women uh, looking for their kids and shouting loudly the names of their children. And when we looked in this direction, we saw the flames litting the sky. Most of the houses around here were on fire. The policemen were not far away from us at that moment and we could hear them shouting, the firing of the guns, and suddenly we joined the people who were uh, running away uh, for their lives. And then I remember on the other side of uh, uh, our house was uh, a house that belonged to one of uh, my dad's very good friends and we heard that some of the soldiers were already in there and moments later as we were running away we could hear him shouting as he was shot dead. Despite the unhappy memories, finding myself here again after so many years, the temptation to see the place I spent my earliest years is too strong to resist. But in these times, no guest is welcome, and it takes a while to overcome the current owner's suspicion. It's a bit funny that I have to seek permission to see the spot where I was born. I get only the briefest glimpse of where I used to live before the lady changes her mind. After our house was burnt down, my parents were left with nothing. No compensation, no apology. Worse still, the government simply gave the land to someone else, leaving us destitute. They know that they are not the original owners, that the land did not belong to them from the beginning. Maybe they bought it from the person who got it after we were ejected out. But still, you know, they know the circumstances with which they got this land. So it's painful, I'd say, painful. The experience of losing everything you have at such a young age is hard to explain. It has in part shaped who I am. Maybe it's what pushes me to report on other places destroyed by conflict. We spent several years living in rented accommodations until my father had saved enough to buy another plot of land. It's been hard being in town without coming straight to see him, as I usually would. My father never went to school, but spent his whole life working as a house builder to ensure that my sister, my brother and I got the opportunities he never had. After a lifetime of hard work, now we can look after him. My father's memories of that night are clouded by the passing years, but some details remain vivid. <laughs> You 
ما تريس هذا ما حسميني ما كان مالي أنا هبين يا خال حام وما ليدو هاد أوان حسست وان كل دحني آه هي وان كل دحني هي أوكا ماشي ده يقول ما تبلغ أمس هذا اللي وين أمم وكا صو هذه هو على صبر إلهي ورسوك بيه حد يبعين إذا بكين على الموجي و بعين على صبر أبو مكة أذكر كيان مسوار كيان كيان ودني كيان أنت ها 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 the school playground where most of the town were in town in the heat of a Kenyan summer is today the local football pitch. Dubad Ali, now a respected elder, was the same age as this young man when he was rounded up that night following the killing of the four government officials. There were two Land Rovers, military Land Rovers with the loudspeakers, telling us, come out of your house and if you don't come, you will, you will regret. So. Everybody in Garissa came to this, uh, to this field. We were surrounded. We stayed in the sun up to midday. And then around uh, 3 p.m., they said women can go to their homes. We thought they were kind, they were, they were good people by releasing the woman. But it is one of the worst days of the history of this region where almost every woman was raped. Almost every woman was raped. By the security forces? By the security forces and the particularly by the army and the police. So we spent the night here. We stayed until the, the following day, you know. And then I think we were released about uh, something like near 3 p.m. when several people died. The British government did not subject the Mau Maus to what the Somalis have been subjected, both by uh, Moi's government and Kenyatta's government. I, I still don't understand what would make the government want to punish an entire community, an entire town. You know, the government is not, that government was not our government. That government owed us no uh, allegiances. Because we were not part of that government. We, had, we, we did not have ministers, we did not have civil, senior civil servants in the government. So it was more or less like the Pretoria government claiming to represent the black people. Comparisons with apartheid South Africa and the British treatment of Kenya's Mau Mau independence fighters may seem far-fetched but the level of violence used by the whites to maintain power in the last half of the 20th century pales into insignificance when compared to the violence used against my community. But the war between Kenyan Somalis and the Kenyan government, known disparagingly as the Shifta or Bandit War, has remained one of Africa's forgotten conflicts. The British had always ruled this area, which they called the Northern Frontier District, or NFD, with a very light hand. They saw the Somalis as good soldiers, but bad subjects. As a Somali, if you wanted to cross the Tana River into Kenya, you needed to seek permission. The NFD was, to all intents and purposes, a separate country. When Kenya's independence was being negotiated in 1962, the British agreed, despite strong opposition from Kenyan leaders, that the NFD will get a chance to vote on whether to join Somalia or Kenya. The commission they sent established overwhelming support for joining Somalia. But the British were unwilling to split the country on the eve of independence, despite their promise to listen to the people. For Kenyan Somalis, this was a terrible betrayal. They refused to vote in the elections and could take no pleasure from the independence celebrations in faraway Nairobi. 
they were left with no choice but to take up arms, supported in part by the Somali Republic. The response of Kenya's president, Jomo Kenyatta, was uncompromising. He declared a state of emergency and with the help of the same British military that suppressed the Mau Mau uprising, Kenya went to war against its own people. The tactics used by the military were to be the same. Villagization, the mass internment of the rural population in concentration camps, detention without trial, and something even the British had never openly admitted, a shoot-to-kill policy. Thousands were to die, and the destruction of livestock forced many more into the towns, altering forever the way of life in northeast province. Deko Ma'alim Sambul was one of the leaders of NFD's independence struggle. As a leader, I never miss the bank I, because one who got me. But I miss the whole Kenyan government, the Majesty government, the ruling class, these two, because why ignore Kenyan, grab it and go. ولكنني <تصفيق> مشكلة NFD هالك سيدا أم بيوتان عن لهيت هالك وهو أمرك إن ضد كان وقوا وضد كود راعو أي سومار النظام ضد كاسنا لور جيو هذا هو ناهيد كان هو ناقض حزكم ما نان ربن إن بربر نكينيا قبل ما ده لقوا مجرين. The war officially came to an end in 1967 when Tanzania brokered a deal between Kenya and Somalia. The end of Somalia's physical and moral support left Kenyan Somalis with no choice but to surrender. The Kenyan government paraded the former shifter for the cameras, but did not revoke the state of emergency. Nor did it forget what it saw as the disloyalty of its Somali population, as was to be demonstrated in Garissa 13 years later. The government has always maintained that no one died in the operation in 1980. No one was robbed, no one raped. Local folklore tells of the bodies being dumped that night in the nearby Tana River and a death toll in the hundreds. If what happened in Garissa was a tragedy, what was to happen in Wajia in the heart of Northeast Province five years later was to eclipse all past atrocities. The UN called it the worst human rights violation in Kenya's history, and this is no exaggeration. This is the road that links the two largest towns in Kenya's northeast province, Garissa and Wajir. A potent symbol of both the lack of development and lack of interest shown by successive governments. Ironically, this poor infrastructure has protected Wajir from much of the recent violence that has engulfed Garissa. In 1984, however, this area had developed a reputation for insecurity. The district suffered from inter-clan violence, mainly over grazing rights, which are, even by the standards of Northeast Province, extremely limited. The rains have been good this year, but in the 1980s, successive droughts had aggravated the problem, as had the inflow of weapons from neighboring Somalia. Like the British before them, the Kenyan government struggled to understand the complexities of clan politics. Their answer to the escalating violence was to disarm the clans, a practical and sensible solution. But as with the massacre in Garissa four years earlier, the contempt in which administrators, police and the army held Somalis was to have fatal consequences. On Friday, February 10th, 1984, a police and military sweep of Wajir was ordered to collect all men from the Degodia clan 
whom the local administrators blamed for the violence. Thousands were brought to the newly built airstrip at Wagala, 10 miles outside town. It was the only fenced area large enough to hold them. For those who survived, it's a place they come back to with great reluctance. Yusuf Ibrahim was a government school teacher in 1984. Caught up in the sweep, he was forced at gunpoint to lie face down on the scalding stones. The first person who made an attempt to flee from this place was a young man. Actually, he ran in this direction. I could raise my head and watch what was happening. And then as he was almost about to get out of the fence, then he was shot down. And then the, I remember the officers who were then doing the torturing and the killing said that uh, that is going to be meat for the hyena. The young man died just outside the fence. Before you were released because you were a government official, mm -hmm. what's the worst thing you saw here? Uh, the humiliation, the beating, the undressing, uh, the denial of water and the food and the shed, and then, you know, collecting our own clothes, and then putting them, putting them, you know, on the back of naked people and setting them on fire it was a scene that, you know, any normal person will shrink from. Geographically, I feel I am a Kenyan, geographically, but uh, fairness and justice per se, I don't believe it exists in Kenya. Yusuf and those like him who could prove they were government officials were released on the second day before the act of torture progressed to mass murder. Most of the detainees, however, were ordinary herders and workers from the town. The treatment they received while being rounded up and later their strip rate among the worst atrocities of the 20th century. Mohammed Gosar was at his house with his family when the soldiers came for him. <laughs>
Nagok malay la siapa? Bi. Walau waktu dah kerja dia, anak hari mana? Thousands were tortured and killed. Yet, Wajir's isolation allowed for a complete media blackout. When the tales did finally come out a month later, the government made the bland assertion that 57 men had been killed during an operation to disarm the clans. No one can put an exact number on the dead. Certainly hundreds died, possibly more than a thousand. But the army was brutally efficient at dispersing the bodies. Only a handful of photos made it out of Wajir. Silent testimony to the atrocities committed. The police and government officials will still not talk. To get answers to what happened in Northeast Province, both then and now, I have to go to the capital, Nairobi. Residents of my province still refer to it as going to Kenya. Nairobi is a melting pot where every one of Kenya's 42 tribes rub shoulders in what is meant to be equality. Promoting the idea of unity has been one of the primary goals of Kenya's leaders since independence. The parliament carries the national motto and catchphrase of the first president, Mze Jomo Kenyatta. Harambe, a Swahili word meaning all together, but the capital statues tell a different story. They pay homage to the big men who have held absolute power since independence. Kenyatta, whose son Uhuru, is now president. And Moy, who oversaw the consolidation of the one-party state in the two decades following Kenyatta's death in 1978. Moy, without any attempt at subtlety, made the tribal rungu or club the symbol of his authority. It was Moy who was president when my home was banned in 1980. But for people from Garissa, it's Gigi Kariuki, Moy's outspoken Minister for Internal Security, who is seen as particularly responsible. A responsibility he still denies. You are seeing it as a Somali, see my people being killed because of land. But you ask yourself, are you genuine in what you are asking? If the people not take arms, the government will not have taken arms. But there was collective punishment. There was raping of women. There was? Ki there was collective punishment. Yes. Killing of women, children, raping women, you know, burning houses. What I, I see, I find problem in Somalia, uh, a person like you. They have never been honest to themselves. To ask them few questions, ask themselves few questions. How would you put women and children in one corner? so that you can deal with the bandits. The bandits who rely on the cover of the innocent people. How, how do you do it? You have to find a way of sorting them out. But are they, uh, are they going to allow it to do those things? Because they come at night, hit and run. But people like you with these uh, computers and whatever, you keep on passing the message. Why are you people deceiving your own community? You need to tell them the truth. 1980, you visited Garissa and the, the newspaper, the, the, the Daily Nation yes. of the 11th of November 1980, quoted you as saying, as I was on the aircraft, yes. I saw some houses were burnt, yes. and, but our forces must be commended for showing restraint. Because the forces' answer was that the fire was lit by the bandit as they, they were running away. And that is also a tactic that is used by, 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 by non-conventional fighters. I was a victim of the Garissa massacre. Yes. And I remember that night not seeing any bandits, but soldiers, government soldiers, putting our house, my home, on fire, on fire. and killing our neighbors. You're killing what? How many people died? Many, many people died. Yeah, Both that's, at where they were interned that's a, that's and also during the night. People have been feeding your people with. So many people died. But when you asked, can you account for them? But what we know is that the bodies were dropped in the Tana River. 
And I was in, I was in the, I would have known, take it from me. Are you saying no one died in Gaza no, no, that night? No, quite a number of people died, but not uh, the figure you people talk about. I've always wanted to meet Gigi Kariuki and ask him exactly what happened on that fateful night. Speaking to him, hearing what he had to say, his continued defense up to today, I think he's just continuing on with the government cover up. And I don't believe much of what he said. I don't. What makes these attitudes harder to accept now is that Kenya is meant to have changed. In 2007, the bloody violence following the contested election results graphically illustrated the deep-seated tribal rivalries in this country. When the dust had settled and a compromised government of national unity was put in place, an attempt was made to finally confront the political violence of Kenya's past. Integral to this process was the Truth, Justice and Reconciliation Commission based on the South African model. For the victims of the Shifta war and the massacres in Garissa and Wajir, it was the first official recognition of their suffering. Mohamed Elmi is now a politician. In 1984, he was one of those who came to the assistance of the men who escaped the massacre in Wajir. What I saw and what has remained very distinctly in my mind today It's a pile of bodies. To my right. And two naked people carrying yet another body to put on the pile. Any belief in North Eastern that the problems of the past would finally be addressed was to be short-lived. In October 2011, Kenyan forces invaded Somalia, provoking the bloody backlash by Al-Shabaab, the Al-Qaeda-affiliated group that controlled much of the country. This was the first time Kenya's troops had crossed its borders in anger. It was to be a costly adventure. It's costly both not just in terms of the financial costs to this country, but also to the fact that um, we have subsequently not been able to deal with the aftermath of the invasion because it was clear that once you went after terrorist groups like uh, the ones in Somalia, then uh, they would tend to attack the country. And we have seen that um, after that invasion, the level of attack in particularly northeastern province, in Mandera and Wajia County and Garuza, has, has, has been significant. How has that changed the economic and political environment in the country? There's generally been a growing and ease about Somalis in the country. And um, there has, in fact, been in parts of uh, the country like Nairobi, uh, incidences of attacks against Somalis whenever an explosion occurs in Isli or in town, anywhere. Um, so there is resentment, you know, that, that these are the people who are causing this. As Somalis, we have also been guilty of tribal prejudice. During the colonial era, we saw ourselves as distinct from Kenya's other tribes and fought to be categorized as Asian, as Indians and Arabs were, rather than African. A dubious privilege for which we paid higher taxes and got to live here in Isli, the area of the capital, then reserved for Asians. Like so many other Somalis, this was the first place I arrived in Nairobi when I came here to study. When the civil war started in Somalia in 1991, Isli was the natural refuge for many of the families fleeing the fighting, earning itself the nickname Little Mogadishu. Kenya also plays host to a half a million more Somalis at the Dadaab refugee camp between Garissa and the border with Somalia. This, combined with the 2011 invasion and the memories of the Shifta war, make for a little mix. At best, we are seen as people of dubious loyalty. At worst, Al-Shabaab. This mistrust was graphically illustrated on the 18th of November 2012, when a crammed Matatu, the minibus Kenyans use daily for transport, was blown up on the outskirts of Isli. A young Somali man was seized and beaten by the crowd. 
Within minutes, there were running battles between Somalis and non-Somalis. The looting of shops, rape and beatings were a grim reminder of how little has changed in my homeland. It took the police several hours to intervene, by which time the damage had been done, much to the anger of the Isli community. Like the residents of Garissa, they suffer from both the violence and the failures of the Kenyan police, who see it as a Somali problem. Why has there been no successes yet? Why have you not apprehended any of the culprits who are carrying out these killings and bombings so far? It's because of the fact that the community does not open up. And remember, these are people from one community. Whether you are Somali from Kenya or you are Somali from Somalia, these are brothers, people from one community. Mr. Wino, you know the history of this region. There have been massacres carried out by government security officials. Now, when you look at that, and the collective punishment that has been going on, is this not a continuation of the failed policies of the past? You should ask yourself, why are you talking about all those massacres you are talking about? We have not had you condemning uh, situations where uh, individuals kill officers collecting revenue. Kenya Revenue Authority officers have been killed in that region. They have not been killed by the police. They have been massacred by the locals. We are not hearing you talking about police massacres by the locals. It's therefore a lie. It's therefore exaggeration. It's therefore indecent to, to, to blame government for primitive actions carried by locals. It's not we the used... entire I'm, I'm... citizenship of Garissa that went and killed these policemen. Excuse, and, and, and excuse me. It's not the entire community, but it is the community. I would say so. And these people are coming from the community. And that's why we're talking about openness. Nobody is even condemning the, 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 the Somali community holistically. You For did. your information. You just did. No, no, no. It's, it's important to be attentive. I said it is members of the society. As an, officer of the, as an officer of the service and as an officer of the law, it is my responsibility to protect the people of Garissa. And we've done it uh, quite abundantly. The day after the riots in Isli, violence would again erupt in Garissa. On the outskirts of the town, three soldiers from the Kenyan military were shot dead when they stopped their truck to change a tire. Within hours, my hometown was once again on fire. It's no coincidence that the target of the military's vengeance was Garissa's central market. The same story, collective punishment, with the same results. Five months later, the market's roof at least is back on. This is the entrance to the market. It's called the Dark Market. It's where thousands of residents of Garissa usually come to find their livelihood. The traders have received no compensation and the bitterness runs deep. The market was completely burnt down and people were punished. Even some of them were killed that day. Now, after all this has happened to you, do you still feel that you are Kenyan? I'm Kenyan. Nobody can change me from that. I'm Kenyan. But a bad employed armed forces have created all that. No, no even sorry. There's nobody came and said sorry. What happened to us? This woman lost everything she had in the fire. And she's saying now she doesn't have any more. She was selling household items at the stall where she was. And in total, she lost about 800,000, which is about $10,000. Now she says she sleeps hungry most of the time. The following day, the anger and frustration of the population towards the police and the military erupted. Abdullahi Barre, a close friend of mine since childhood, and a government official tried to calm the protesters and was shot when the military fired into the crowd. He was 33 years old. He leaves his mother, already herself a widow, to look after his four orphan children.
دو کار نکردم نه شد داد که آکالد دیدم و اروی استعاق اسکرت مطمئن کنم هنوز استعاق بیلیس بیلیس و داد کلا این شعب کارلو مینن ارساس جوجی ارساس جوجی سکم بالو قبض باشه او خیره نه آنو اکو دیگه اسکی جوگا تلفن ایستاد اس اگو اگه تلفن سکم نبود اسالد نه ایستاد تلفن کی ایستاد او استعاق نه آرد کان کپتن کبلا و سکم سریر تبل سارا تر میشاد او تو فرت دیل مال هه به نم بون ولی ما این تو اکو نه هه این که ما این تو دنبه سیدس سیدس آنو اگه إلا هاد وحبارتان لو سمي عد محكمة لو سوت تاجي دل كيس مجرتها ما بحكمة هاد لو سوت تاجي ما له محا وقدرن أو متقنا كحصوصتها وحي أنا سو حصوصا أنا إمبا وحان هاد كل ما مكرنا ما أنا سائد هل أنا شكدي ساسا كقدوم هي Typical. It's typical. It's just typical of the way. We are treated. Typical of the way we are treated in a country we call our own. Five months later, I found myself reporting on the worst gate attack in Nairobi. More lives torn apart by violence. As a Kenyan, I watched these scenes with horror. As a Kenyan Somali, I fear the backlash. President Uhuru Kenyatta has sought to reassure us that the country is united and tolerant. As one national family, we recognize with one mind the distinction between terrorism and Islam. I hope this is true. I hope that some good can come from this terrible tragedy and we can finally move on from the mutual suspicion and mistrust of the shift of war years. I hope that 50 years on, the dream of independence can finally be realized. One nation where we are all Kenyans.